Moving on, quickly wanted to quickly recap the United v Porto game the other day. Um, obviously, most of you know what the result was. It was 3-3 in the end. We bit of a weird game, I'm not going to lie. Bit of a weird game. I felt like we should have probably won, even though we weren't playing well and Porto dominated most of the game. Weird thing to say, but I think in European football, if you get gifted two goals like we did, especially after weathering that storm, because it felt like for the first 10 minutes, Porto were all over us, like a rash, um, especially in the, within the first five, sorry. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I was watching the game live and I think they had a chance on goal. I think Porto had a chance on goal within the first minute or something around that sort of mark. They had the chance on goal. So it was looking kind of dicey for us. Um, but we were able to weather that early storm away from home in their stadium, which is the Al, Al Madrigal, I think the name of it is. Um, it's a very intimidating stadium, kind of similar to what you'd face if you were going to face one of those Turkish sides. But we weathered the storm. We did pretty well. And then we scored two goals. I wouldn't say by fluke, but two goals by keeper's mistake, especially the first one. Max Rashford did pretty well anyway for the lead up to it. He got the ball on the wing, attacked his man, dribbling um, in and out, in and out, dribbled inside to the box. And by, by the time he got into the box, you no know, one wanted to touch him because he wanted to give her a penalty. Able to do a couple of feints and then bang, smashed it near post. And um, the Diogo Costa should have saved it. Diogo Costa had a, had a fucking nightmare. He was terrible, terrible that night, which is really bad because I think that was like his audition for the world stage because a lot of teams are looking at him United in, in you know uh, United 2 I've heard or from the rumour mill and he's one of those keepers that everyone thinks is going to be like the next kind of big keeper but he was terrible 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 um, he let the ball kind of he, let, he tried to save it with his feet when he could have probably saved it with his hands and it went kind of underneath him or through him so he'd be disappointed with that one the second goal was my favourite I'm not going to lie that was my favourite goal because it involved Hoyland doing some quintessential striker play the ball comes up into the middle i think into the halfway line hoyland jumps up heads the ball down i think heads it to fucking ericsson or someone in the midfield and then it, and then he runs into the area the ball goes out wide to rashford then to ericsson then him to him in, in the box again and he finishes it with a great kind of strike across the keeper which i think he should have saved as well but all, all in all for a striker play because you know hoyland and zerski are really feeding on peanuts at United. So it was just nice to see Hoyland be able to play that role and score a goal like that. The quintessential striker goal where you kind of knock it down, pass it out wide and you run into the area waiting to finish it. I fucking love that goal. And I thought from then on, with us being 2-0 up, if it was up to me and I was a coach, I would have definitely gotten on an extra defender. I felt like Martinez and Delit were very, very shaky the entire game. Again, not, not really their fault. I think there's just too much, too many gaps in the in the in the midfield in general. Um, I think the gaps in the midfield essentially leave Martinez and Dillet with too much space to defend. And I think from what we've seen in recent games, Martinez and Dillet are not good defenders with space in front of them. I don't think nowadays there's many defenders who can defend with space in front of them. But I think especially Martinez and Dillet, they struggle a lot if they've done a lot of space in front of them and were not compact. And they were getting run around in rings and the dead, you know, they were basically getting outnumbered in that position with um, Porto in the field and runners off. That Samu kid up front looked very frightening. And um, yeah, I would have taken off Martinez and brought on Harry Maguire earlier or even taken off Ericsson or somebody and made that midfield a little bit more um, assured and brought on an extra defender to kind of shore things up. But that didn't happen. And of course, Porto were able to get a quick goal back and then they all basically went into the break 2-2 and essentially we threw the game away. From then on, it was never likely that we we're going to come back into the game. We kind of threw it back. We threw it away when we could have easily won it. Um, but to be fair, Samu, the kid up front, he was really scary. Um, every time he got on the ball, he looked really sharp. Um, he's definitely a striker that I think will easily, easily, easily be going on the transfer market for 100 million plus. Um, he's got physicality. He's got pace. Um, he looks like he can finish. Like he, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he might have got like four chances or five in total, and he scored two of them. Um, the second goal in particular was a really great finish, a superb, superb finish. Top corner, like, you know, uh, passes the ball out wide, runs into the box, similar to kind of Hoyland, and he's able to kind of run in front of his man in the lit and smash it top corner. So that Samu kid looked fucking brilliant. But again, United also made him look like fucking Drogba reincarnated. So as good as he played, I think we obviously um, helped him to, um, you know, ball out as we always do with strikers. And then, of course, and then, of course, the worst thing happened. The worst thing possible happened. Bruno Fernandes got sent off. The Bruno Fernandes sending off was on the cards because he the first yellow card he got in the first half for a high foot was very unnecessary, in my opinion. 
There was no need for it. He was never going to get the ball. We weren't desperately needing to get the ball in that position. He flew in with his foot high. And in Europe, you know that you can't get away with that sort of stuff. The argy-bargy, aggressive, front foot, you know, whatever reckless play you can get away with in the Premier League, you never get away with it in Europe. Everybody knows that. You have to be a little bit more cultured, a little bit more, dare I say, cute and considered in, in Europe. Bruno Fernandes didn't do that. He left his foot up. The referee gave him yellow card, whatever. Second half comes around and he's basically walking on a tightrope now because he got a silly yellow card in the first half. And then, of course, he does the same thing again in the second half towards the end of the game. He gets another yellow card for the same thing. Two yellow cards, he's off. Me personally, considering how terrible he was, because it was a weird game with Bruno Fernandes. He was shit overall. He didn't influence the game at all. But I did feel like he was told not to do what he usually does and just spray the ball up top and just do the hit and hopes and shit. He was a lot more disciplined. It felt like he was standing in a midfield position way more than running around the entire pitch trying to be Captain America and shit, right? But still, uh, Captain getting two red cards in technically a week is very is unforgivable. I think especially if you're the captain, you have to get dropped. But more than likely, he's going to play against fucking Aston Villa tomorrow on Sunday. You know he's going to start. But if that was any other team, a player of that caliber, a player with his standing being a captain should be dropped for being, you know, it, obviously the, the previous yellow card against Tottenham got overturned. But still, you're too reckless, bro. You got a red card already in a week and what you're doing now, you're costing the fucking, the team the game. Makes no mistake. Anyway, that happens. Um, and then, of course, that puts the favor of the game back into fucking, um, what's it called, face? Um, Porter's, Porter's position. Porter also, they were pretty shit themselves. The manager shit the bed and took off Samu. I think he should have kept him on and they would have probably scored another goal and then they would have killed the game. I, I think 3-2 for them was too dangerous because of how terrible their defense was. I think our both defenses were terrible. Both keepers were pretty terrible too. I think, you know, Onana should have saved a couple of their chances as well. So it was basically who was going to outscore who. And when we went down to 10, their manager decided to take off Samu for some reason. That completely shifted the balance of the game. We didn't really have much of a... They didn't really trouble us up front anymore. And then, of course, um, Eric Ten Hag made what at the time felt like a bad decision by taking off two centre-backs and replacing them with another two centre-backs. But it did pay off dividends because Harry Maguire ended up scoring the equaliser right at the end. And a note to Harry Maguire, man. Let's give a note a note to Harry Maguire because I've been the biggest hater of Harry Maguire for a very, very long time. And just because I think for his transfer fee, just because of the fucking England protection around him, because of the issue that happened with Greece, because of some of his comments pre-match, right he's 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 a bit of a cunt let's not let's not you know let's not mince any words about it he's a bit of a cunt but we have to give harry Maguire a lot of credit he's a model professional man he's been stripped of the captaincy he's been disregarded the club's been trying to sell him for a while and you never hear this guy complain he never complains he never moans he keeps his head down keeps training keeps being available for the team and when needed he steps up and today well the other day he stepped up and got and got us basically a point that we probably didn't deserve to get so harry Maguire deserves a lot of fucking credit because other players in his position will throw their toys out of the pram will have their agents talking to the press all that malarkey and it doesn't fucking happen so big up big up harry Maguire for absolutely being a g and i think for this particular form and how he stepped into the team especially because he's shown now that you know the lit's not that much better than him really i think he deserves to i think he deserves to start a few more games really and truly i think he's earned it he's i would even go as far i think i think he's earned the right to have a little contract extension a little cheeky year added on or two years he's definitely earned it for his professionalism and his ability to always be available for the team and do what needs to be done when called upon so big up harry Maguire, but in general horrible result um we had victory in our hands we could have easily won this porto team wasn't as scary as i thought they would be um all those transfers have definitely cost them over the years they're not as strong as they once were not as scary as previous um you know porto teams but of course our defense and our inability to play as a team affected us and we ended up drawing 3-3 but to be fair i'm not really that bothered about europa league anyway I'd, i could care less about this european campaign um i'm more worried about the league and where we finish in there i don't want to finish him in the table again so i'll see how that kind of pans out we'll see how that obviously pans out um and then obviously continuing on from that we have a lot of news regarding eric ten Hag. um i for one wanted him to be you know obviously i was very vocal about being eric ten Hag out I'd never been the biggest fan of him. I think it's been really disappointing. And I would say, you know, not to be hyperbolic or not to be flipping, 
dramatic, but it's been really disappointing, really heartbreaking how bad Eric Ten Hag's tenure has been, especially for those of us who wanted him as, as a manager at United. I was one of those people, one of the fans of him at Ajax, seeing the way they played, seeing how they destroyed teams at Real Madrid in the Champions League, how they won the league, the intensity of their play, their aggression, the amount of goals they scored per game, the plays, the combination. It was a match made in heaven because I think United fans like myself, we weren't, I, di- I didn't think we were going to get Eric Ten Hag and continue to win trophies and challenge for a league title. That wasn't the aim for me. I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if any of the United fans are the same. I want him to come in and make us play football again, make the games exciting again, make, you know, watching United not a fucking bore and just have us playing some good football, maybe bring in some youngsters, decent signings, and then leave a good foundation for the next manager to, to take up. I never thought he was going to come in and have us winning trophies because obviously the league, you know, at the moment, the top teams like Arsenal, Man City, Liverpool, they're way, way, way ahead of us. We've got a long way to go. We still need to be a stable and consistent top four club, which we're not at the moment. We keep yo-yoing up and down. But that didn't happen. So instead, we've got trophies, but we're winning, we're scumbagging trophies. And we're playing some of the worst football I've ever seen. Legitimately, you know, game in, game out. It's completely, you know, it's a bore fest. It makes you want to fucking, you know, dig your eyes out with a spoon. It's horrendous football. It's the same players again and again, running players into the ground. Lack of tactical variation. There's not, there's, it doesn't feel like there's a meritocracy in the squad. Certain players get preferential treatment and get picked game after game. Other players get dropped based on how he wakes up and what mood he's on. I look at someone like an Ahmad. Ahmad could score a hat-trick one week, but you're not sure if he plays the next week. Bruno Fernandes could play a 2 out of 10 for a whole season and never get fucking substituted. It's all over the place. Falling out with players. like It's been a complete and utter failure. And with the league finish last season, 8th, he should have been fired. There's no way United managers should finish 8th, playing the way we played, and keep the job because of an FA Cup or a technicality. He should have got fired last season. He didn't. They gave him an extra season, and, and I think... You know, maybe the Ineos thought he could take some of that good feeling around the FA Cup win final and take it into a new season. That didn't happen categorically. And now we've started off the season as we fucking ended last season. And it's been a complete horror show. But United, even with this new partial ownership with Ineos, I just don't feel like we move quick enough. I feel like a top club, an elite club in any other league in the world, Serie A, you know, La Liga and shit, they would have fired him already. They would have sacked him already. But we just move so slow. We have to wait until things get really, really, really bad and negative until we make a decision. And I think that's really a you know a negative to the whole club overall. Because all that goodwill, all that favor, all that, you know, good vibes about the transfer window and shit's completely dissipated. You know, we, there were so much good feelings around Ugate signing, you know, Zerski signing, and now it's you know Mazwari, Delir. Everybody was really giddy and happy, myself included. And now that good sentiment's completely gone. So, if anything, Eric Ten Hag should be fired for the way we're playing, for the results and shit, but more so for the mood around the club. The mood around the club is dire, and he needs to go, and it needs to be fixed. But the news around it is really interesting because it seems like a lot of people are suggesting if we lose against Villa tomorrow, he's out which obviously, you know, he deserves. But, you know, I don't think if we win against Villa, he should also keep a job. He should should go anyway, regardless. But anyway, the feeling behind it is that we've got two options. If Eric Ten Hag does get sacked um, after the Villa game, most likely we're going to hire an interim manager and then hire our permanent manager after the fact. Now, the problem is some people, like myself included, are very nervous about this interim thing because he did the same thing with Ole. We did the same thing with Ole and we gave him the job when he shouldn't have got the job at, at the interim, after the interim stage and we ended up costing us long term. So if it was up to me, if it was up to me and because I'm a sucker for suffering, I would actually let Ericsson Hart keep the job until the end of the season. Let him try and turn this thing, turn it around. If he doesn't turn it around, let him suffer with us. Let him have to go through the press conferences, having to answer questions about his style of play, having to answer questions about his selection, having to answer questions about his formation, his tactics. Let him suffer with us. We all suffer. He suffers too throughout the entirety of the end of the end of, end of season. And then you send him on your way and then you hire your permanent manager. That's what I would personally do. I wouldn't go with the whole interim thing. I don't think that is the way to go because if imagine Ruve Lichere comes in, imagine if Rude comes in and he suddenly has us playing fucking champagne football. Imagine if that happens. Then what? We give him a permanent job and then he shits the bed after after Christmas. Then what? You know? 
Like, I don't want that to repeat itself again. And I think Rude still has a lot of way to kind of go to sort of like, you know, earn his rep as well and to get more experience too. Um, so I would rather I would rather get Everton Hard finish the job until the summer. You suffer with us at the same way and then hire the new permanent manager in the summer, which I'm not really too bothered about. I just want to coach. I'm not really, I don't really care who it is. If it's the guy at Sporting, if it's Thomas Tuchel, if it's Nagelsmann, I want a coach who's going to be able to come in and coach these players, improve some of the players that we have and be able to have us playing a good brand of attractive football and also defending as a team have us compact i hate the spaces between the midfield and the defense and the defense and the midfield i hate how players get isolated i hate how hard it is for us to score a goal compared to other teams or even create a chance i feel like when we face other teams porto included the other day they as soon as they get the ball you know two or three passes they already passed our halfway line with us it takes it's so laborious for us to get any sort of momentum to get to the you know to the forward line the attackers don't really link up well the admit i don't know i just i just hate how disjointed the team is so i want a coach to come in to actually coach these players coach this team get us playing a good brand attractive football have us defending as a unit attacking as a unit and then obviously improving the players that we already have i don't care transfers put that to one side improve what we already have and then kind of see how we kind of you know how it shakes out at the end of the season but before we get there there's a couple stories here regarding Ericsson Hag future the first one says there is some tension between Ericsson Hag and Ruben Lishroyd a speculation has grown that the former Manchester United striker was recruited by Enios in the summer because he would be a safe pair of hands should United change manager be required that was obvious I think Ericsson Hag should have been very disrespected I'm surprised he actually took the job or even stayed on because that's a very disrespectful thing from the club he was Given the job on a technicality, because I guess the player, the manager that they want didn't want to sign. I think they interviewed Tuchel and somebody else. I forgot who it was. But in the end, it didn't work out. So they went back to Eric Ten Hag and said, hey, you stay for another season. Um, so if it was me and I was Eric Ten Hag, I think most coaches wouldn't have taken it because they didn't consider him the first option. They sort of kept him on a back burner and then obviously gave him on the technicality because the other guys said no. Um, then I would have been also very aggrieved if they didn't go out and sign another coach to, to bolster your coaching staff but the coach that they signed is a coach that a lot of people kind of rate he's a United legend also it would feel like a little bit of an inside job it would feel like a little bit of a they've like you know they've put a mole in my coaching staff you know, for the purpose of overseeing and reporting back what I do and also for the purposes of like safeguarding in case I do get sacked so if I was Ericsson Hag I w my alarm bells would have been ringing the moment fucking River Lister got the job that was always a sign for me that their long term future wasn't with Ericsson Hag anyway they kind of always had a fail safe there. Um, the next story regarding Ericsson Hag is this. Ruben Lishroyd will be offered the Man United job on an interim basis if Ericsson Hag is sacked. However, Van Lishroyd is worried about being seen as the man who betrayed Ericsson Hag. A source in Holland said, Van Lishroyd is a principled guy. He felt betrayed at Eindhoven and he will not want to be viewed as a man who went behind Ericsson Hag's back. I understand how he feels like that. That makes sense. But he has to look, out, he has to look, he has to look out for number one. The opportunity to manage a club like United doesn't come around often, especially given where we're at, at the moment. Most likely, if another manager comes in and does what they should be doing, and then another manager takes us to another level, he won't get a chance to manage the club anyway. Again, so this is the chance to get in while we're shit, get in while we're, it's a bit chaotic and messy and all over the place. You know, get us steer the ship correctly, get us playing well, and then we can he can kind of you know um continue from there. Um. But I understand his feelings because I think, you know, coming in through the back door, last minute coaching edition, and then that manager gets fired and you get a job is a bit mad. And I've also noticed he's also taken a bit more of a, I felt like he's taken a bit of a back foot in, in, in the in the sidelines. But recently he's been shouting and screaming a bit more against Porto. He got even a yellow card for being a lot more passionate and aggressive on the line, on touchline while Eric Hall just sat there. So I wonder if that kind of plays into it. I'm not too sure. And then the next particular one we got here is this news regarding Paul Pogba. Um, Paul Pogba has had his drugs ban overturned, or sorry, reduced, or not overturned, but reduced to 18 months. At first, I think it was four years, which basically would have meant his career would have been over. But um, 18 months, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he can train already by the end of the year and be available for Juventus by March. But now Juventus are saying that now nah, they're going to terminate his contract. They don't want him to play anymore because he probably missed out on too much football. The club's moved on. Motta, I think, as a manager there, probably doesn't really see him and his plans anymore. But he's probably still happy because he gets a chance to play professional football again, which obviously, you know, being a big Pogba fan, I'm absolutely happy for him. I wouldn't mind him coming back for one, one, one more 
one, one, one more last, last dance. <laughs> I wouldn't mind him coming back, honestly, especially now. Like, I think Pogba had to had to struggle playing for a United team with not much kind of, you know, midfield option or solidity or quality. Now we've got far more quality in midfield. We're way more balanced. So he wouldn't have to do what he has to do when he was at the club before, which is basically play as a DM and play as an attacking midfielder and be boxer box. So I think now if you did sign him, he could just spray balls left and right. He could play the way he played, you know, and, you know, make those late runs into the box, scoring goals. I'd fucking love him at United. I'm not going to lie. It's unlikely going to happen, but I would love him to come back for one last dance, especially now, um, given what we're kind of going for. But personally, happy for him in his career. Happy that he can play football again i think there's rumors about him going to the mls or something but if he can train already by december which is basically around the corner and playing again already by march like basically next season he's ready to play so congratulations to paul pogba glad he's got his drugs ban overturned he said i think it was an error he just you know had something he wasn't meant to have but it wasn't in, you know a purposeful thing but regardless happy they, they listened to his appeal and paul pogba will be back on a pitch sooner rather than later so big up pp Big up PP, come back to United, my friend. Please come back to United, my friend.